everyone. Uh, good morning, especially to everyone who has traveled and who is uh, jet lagged. Uh, also, thanks for showing up uh, day zero of KubeCon at well, 9 in the morning, although it's uh, 9.30 now and we're starting late. So today, we're going to talk about uh, profiling. There is a bit of uh, BPF um, and about how uh, where dwarfs and elves uh, come in on this journey. Uh, and, but before that, a bit of a story and an introduction. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, so this is a graph. Uh, metrics graph, uh, what it shows the uh, CPU course usage against uh, time. So uh, you can see a normal baseline there, but there are these spikes. And uh, uh, these random spikes, uh, they're basically oom kills. So uh, process takes up too much memory, uh, programs crash, and uh, you don't know why the program has crashed. You have theories. And uh, then you can like uh, try some debugging, see what the system has uh, gone through. But uh, you, this is like a post uh, incident. Uh, as the incident happens, you have nothing to stop it, really. So um, there are theories, but we don't really know. What we need is actually data. And uh, so that brings me to my next slide. Uh, so we need data like this, exactly. So this um, offers some insights into what was happening. And it would be nice if we could have this data all the time uh, as we are running the application, right? So sorry, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'll explain the visual here later. But uh, it would be nice to see how much each function is basically consuming uh, how much CPU. And uh, that should give us an idea of what's actually causing these memory spikes and uh, causing programs to crash or take up too much uh, time. So this is basically uh, what my talk's going to be about. How do we uh, go from taking a program to reaching this point and getting this kind of data? So an introduction. I am Sumera. My day job is uh, staring at those uh, icicle graphs that I just showed you. And uh, on the process, we discover very cool compiler uh, things and a very weird uh, kernel adjacent low level uh, uh, bugs, maybe, or but uh, interesting processes, data structures. And uh, I'm also a Parka agent maintainer. Parka is the software I'll be talking about. It's an open source project. and. Um, I contribute to it. And uh, as for my job, I work as a junior software engineer at Polar Signals. Uh, we do profiling and uh, observability in general. So I'm sorry about the video not being able to load. So let's talk profiling. And uh, what's profiling? It's as old as programming. And uh, it's, uh, it's what we consider programming right now is like uh, dynamic program analysis. It can also be technically, uh, statically program analysis, but that, I think, happens uh, post-incident. Uh, dynamic, we mean as the process is running, we can uh, uh, measure resources that uh, consume either memory or CPU time, um, and uh, how often we're calling functions and how much space that's taking up. Um, so there is something called as uh, sampling profilers. What sampling profilers do is they so like every uh, 10 or 100 seconds per second, they try to get a snapshot of the state. And uh, they do it for some duration and send the snapshot. But it doesn't happen continuously, right? So why we need profiling is basically uh, we want to improve performance. Uh, we save money because uh, you know we optimize things. Then you, we use less CPU time. and then. Uh, so basically, we, ha we can use more of our resources uh, in the same time. And uh, it's great. But the problem with sampling profilers is that uh, it is uh, only momentary. We don't get a continuous one. And we, we only have to can start profiling once we detect the problem. So we don't know as we are leading up to the problem. We don't really know what's going on. 
and uh, it's not really automated. We might have to instrument the code. Uh, we can do this without instrumenting the code as well, but uh, often it's a very tedious process. We don't have like a one-click solution uh, right now. So that brings me to continuous profiling. What's continuous profiling? Uh, continuous profiling is basically where we, like it says, we continuously profile as the program changes, as a new function is called, as your low-level uh, kernel functions uh, change. Um, we profile that, and the profiles that you see, they change accordingly. So you know in real time what's going on. Uh, so this is like a visual just saying, like over time, you can see how much CPU is used, how much memory is allocated, uh, how much uh, heap, uh, what's going on with the heap. And uh, now let's move on to high resolution dynamic continuous profiling. What I mean by high resolution dynamic profiling here is that we get uh, data with a very high level of granularity. Uh, this is something I mentioned in my abstract, and this is something that we that is very important when you want to see data. You can't just see high-level data that oh this this is the core of the CPU that crashed, or you know getting an idea of that this is the program that crashed. Uh, so I maybe this is the part, maybe it's a garbage collector, maybe there is a memory leak somewhere. Um, but we want data that's more uh, refined. So we want to be able to you know, see all the processes on our machine. We want to see the uh, process name, the process ID, the name of the binary, not just the um, binary that as you name it, but the binary as per, you know, uh, as per, the, uh, as per your um, PROC uh, API, right? That's uh, what's going to help us ultimately. So um, then. We have, um, like I said, uh, if you look at this visual, this is um, our, uh, this is the Parka server. Um, this is showing us basically all the processes that are running currently in the system, and uh, each uh, trace that you see or each line that you see represents one process. And um, so, this is I, I was hovering on uh, one of the process, and. Um, I think uh, this is the, okay, I, I, I cannot see the name of the process, but um, uh, you can see some of the labels that we see there. They have a binary name of the binary, and uh, uh, okay, this is the uh, Beam uh, uh, process that's in Erlang. I think I was running an Erlang program at the time. So you can see the name of the binary there is like, a, with the com label, and uh, then there is a build ID, and we'll get to details of what this means later, but um, what I wanted to showcase here is uh, you can also see the functions and the uh, stack trace uh, for uh, the process, you know. And uh, we can also, now going on to the next one, uh, this, is, um, this is Parker itself, actually. So uh, in the previous one, we were seeing a lot of the processes. I think there's a system-wide view, like uh, you know, you have a root, and then there are uh, different functions. But then you can zoom in on one frame, say, right? And this is for Parka. So you can uh, see, uh, you know, uh, there is the root, there is the runtime, the Go runtime being called, and uh, uh, here, if you hover over the frames or the stack trace, you can see some more information. So what's the cumulative amount of uh, CPU usage? Cumulative means, like, suppose uh, we were talking about function A. Uh, function A's cumulative CPU usage means uh, the amount of CPU A itself uses, but also the amount of CPU used uh, by everything that A calls. So, uh, and you can also see the file, uh, exactly which file which uh, the function is in and uh, which line number. And then you can see the address it takes in memory. The, there's something called the build ID, and there's the name of the binary that's Parka. And uh, this is just basically another view 
uh, we have in Parka, where you can see things, uh, the same information, but in a table. You know, should you want a bit more like uh, formatted data, if you want to uh, search, um, you can do some of uh, that also using this. It's just a bit more, uh, less visualization and more, I think, uh, structure, to put it in one way. Um, then, uh, this is uh, another visual, like what are the labels that we have in Parka, right? Um, we um, keep trying to add labels as per uh, end user requirements and as we require. Uh, so like uh, here you can say, uh, you can query the CPU samples to get like, because when you have like all the processes, it becomes very difficult to find the processes. Some processes use very, very little memory, like uh, um, or very less CPU, like if you want something uh, uh, to find something about like your, say, graphics subsystem, a lot of that uh, as compared to a program that you're actively running, like uh, a, say a Fibonacci sequence uh, that uh, is taking up a lot of uh, time, CPU time. So um, it's, it's very difficult to like pinpoint on like uh, your display. So that's why we have labels, so we can just uh, search by binary name. We can search by uh, the compilers that uh, the program uses. So if you know that uh, you, you run a lot of your programs, uh, they're compiled using, say, LLVM, but there is this one thing that's compiled using um, Musil. So uh, that is something that would help. And uh, there are very, if you want to see uh, the kernel release versions, so these are the prog uh, binaries with, uh, with a certain kernel release version, that's something you can, um, uh, also look up and uh, so uh, next we have target discovery for high resolution profiling. Again, these are all the things that we want when, when I say we want uh, data with a very high level of granularity. But how do we get here from like, uh, we just have a program, right? We just have access to a process. Uh, so how do we get here? So. All we really need is the binaries and uh, the process ID, or like access to the root access to the proc map uh, system. And um, so, this is something I call this target discovery, discovering all the processes that are running in your system. Uh, we profile system-wide, uh, so we basically go through the proc uh, API and we see, is this a process? Well, let's profile it and find out about it. And just have the data in case, you know, this crashes, so we can know what's, uh, what's causing all of those errors. Um, this is a view. So Parka has this agent that uh, runs uh, on your machine. And uh, the agent is actually uh, what we use for target discovery and uh, getting this stack information. Parka is mostly the backend server that makes uh, sense of it and visualizes it. So in the Parka agent, we get the labels uh, sort of like uh, this. You c there is there's a compiler name, there's a C group name, there is a build ID. I'll get to what build IDs are in a bit. And uh, there is a process, uh, there's a PID, there's the architecture of the uh, binary. Uh, the binary is meant for there's a kernel release, the name of the executable. And uh, if, if there is debug information in the binary or if it is stripped, you can see one of the labels says, uh, uh, I hope it's visible, but one of the labels uh, says it's stripped. So, um, you know, we want to know if the debug information is present in the binary, uh, which makes it very easy for us to extract that. Or, you know, if it's not, and we have to go with a very convoluted and uh, difficult way to do it. So, next thing. Uh, what's, what I had in the um, title is uh, dwarfs and elves. So what are dwarfs and elves? They're very related to um, how to, um, they're not technically part of eBPF, uh, just to give you an idea, but uh, there is something uh, that we use eBPF to uh, work through, and um, eBPF makes it very easy for us to parse what we call dwarf and elves. But um, what's dwarf and elf? Oh, sorry. So, okay, I'm, ah, okay, I think I missed a slide there. Okay, so dwarf and elf. So binaries, like I said, all we need is a binary, right? Now binaries are uh, generally like very complicated 
uh, things, I guess. Um, and uh, let's, uh, you know, there is this very popular command in Linux. It's called the file command. And so let's see what is there in a binary. If we use the file command on, uh, I'm uh, using it on Parker agent binary. So we'll notice something. It gives us an output of like uh, something that says elf, um, that uh, show, uh, tells us the endianness. Uh, then it shows us the architecture. We can see uh, it's ARM64. Um, is it statically linked? Is it dynamically linked? Um, then what's the build ID? And uh, does it have debug info? Uh, and it's not stripped. Uh, so, um, so what do we mean by these terms? Um, so binary has several sections. So there is a section known as uh, dwarf. Uh, there is a section known as elf. There is the executable code. If it's a Go binary, you also have a, a uh, go PC line tab uh, part and uh, uh, so what's ELF? Uh, so it's a file format basically. So it's a binaries on Linux have uh, uh, the there are different formats, but Linux binaries uh, mostly are standardized and used the ELF format. It's uh, executable, uh, linkable format, and um, uh, there are a lot of things, uh, a lot of ways you can interpret the L format, but one of the uh, really good ways to do it is using the dwarf specification. What's dwarf? It's a debugging format, and uh, we can use it to basically parse the, um, a lot of the um, sections of the ELF files. And uh, uh, a, a talk on dwarf, uh, or explaining details about Dwarf would be five separate talks in itself because it's a 400-page uh, specification which we do not have time for right now. Um, uh, what's uh, debug info? So debug info is what it says. It's uh, debug information that's usually stored in a binary, but it uh, it you know makes the binary a bit uh, what we call I don't know. Uh, uh, longer or larger, yeah, larger. And uh, so sometimes a lot of people just strip it um, from the binary. And uh, that um, makes life a bit harder for us, I guess. But uh, um, there are debug info these servers where, uh, you know, uh, for every distro usually that strip debug infos. So there's a binary and there is the uh, debug info with that, but like, it would be nicer if they came in the same package, but okay, we'll find a way around it. Now, now debug infos, uh, binaries have something called a build ID, which you can see in the, um, when we are using the file command, you can see the build, there is a build ID. And debug infos are associated with this build IDs. That's why even when they're stripped, we have something to link them together, right? And uh, so, what actually, and there are several other tools also to read the binary with the elf and the dwarf information. Uh, but I'll be uh, talking a bit about read elf. That's, uh, that's uh, one I use. So if we use uh, read elf as something like I said, it, uh, it can take your binary, read what's going on. Uh, so this is when we use read elf on Parker agent. Um, and um, this is on the executable code. Uh, you can see it says contents of the EH frame section. EH actually here stands from, for exception handling, and frame is um, um, okay. So I, it seems like I have one more minute to wrap up. Um, that's uh, sad, but okay. We have read elf by uh, information. I'll, I'll zip through, and um, we have to basically parse this. And uh, we try to put it in tables, which uh, uh, shows us the start of a function and the end of uh, address uh, of a function. And then there is the program counter for each. Uh, we have that for different architectures. It looks slightly different. Um, then we use, uh, basically, we're reading the registers and their offsets. So we read them. We read them using eBPF, which makes it very fast. And uh, that helps us build a stack trace. And a stack trace is essentially really just uh, memory addresses. And then we send them uh, in a very compressed uh, format to the server, Parka server. Uh, in the Parka server, we fetch the debug infos I talked about earlier. We link it to the build IDs. We already have the uh, build IDs here in the compressed format. So we take the memory addresses, essentially, and then turn them into functions. Uh, so we have our stack trace now. And, uh, uh, we have, uh, how do we do this in Park? How does Park Agent do this? Uh, it, uh, we, um, 
run a vProfile uh, using eBPF uh, with a perf event hook. So this helps us read the registers, and um, uh, 19 times uh, every second it sends uh, data and, uh, to the uh, server. And uh, that's, that's how we use, uh, we go from a cycle of uh, binaries. Uh, I had, uh, yeah, that's why we have the binaries, then we uh, look underneath them. We um, have dwarf information. Uh, and there are frame points also, but like um, we use that to fetch memory addresses, uh, compress it, send it in a format, and uh, then we use the server to symbolize the memory addresses, and voila, we have our uh, stack traces. So I think uh, there, there's more lovely stories I'd like to share. Uh, we have support for all these languages, and actually some more uh, right now are in the works, like Luajet and uh, uh, some more languages, but um, I, I would have loved to talk about the stories about these languages, but uh, uh, I, we're really out of time, and I am sorry for uh, all the time it took to set things up. Um, but I hope you liked the talk, and thank you again for your patience and everything. And uh, if you're interested, uh, I'm there on Discord, reach out to us, um, and uh, I'll be there in the hallway track or here. So. Feel free to reach out to anybody from Polar Signals. Um, and uh, we would really like a lot of feedback uh, on this because uh, it's still, um, it's like almost two years old now or three, but like uh, we still want to have the best uh, or state of the art open source profiling. This is the first of its kind, it's zero instrumentation. So we really want uh, feedback on. Uh, how to improve this and make it best. So try it out, let us know. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>